principal of the Margaret Bofford Institute of Theology. And it is my great joy and pleasure and privilege to welcome you all, and especially Peter, Petra, and Tora, uh, to this um, amazing celebration of the book, The Philosopher's Daughters. And many enormous congratulations to you on publishing this, this important book. Just a few words um, about the Institute. And I also want to, to especially welcome our uh, viewers on Zoom who are joining us online. So it's lovely uh, to be with. Thank you for being with us and it's lovely to, for us to, to have you with us. So a few words about the Institute. We are a Roman Catholic member of Cambridge Theological Federation, which is a body of 12 houses representing different Christian denominations and one interreligious organization. Um, our Institute offers courses that range from ethics, philosophical theology, to pastoral practice and theological reflection to students of all levels. We also teach short courses, we resource schools, parishes, hospitals and prisons with expertise, training and pastoral support. We are a very small team of staff uh, with a big community, a research community of over 40 research associates and fellows. And we have two research uh, institutes attached to us. Um, one is Center for Ecclesial Ethics, it was launched only a couple of years ago and the Religious Life Institute um, that uh, Sister Gemma Simmons is the director of. We subscribe to the dialogical model of engagement, so it is fitting for us to celebrate this remarkable book and um, the book that promotes dialogue not only within the family, but also interdisciplinary uh, dialogue uh, that books promotes. Just a very few words about the editor of the publication, Dr. Peter Vardy, uh, who is an ex-colleague of mine, and some of us here uh, know Peter from Heathrop College, University of London, where Peter taught philosophy, philosophy of religion for many, many years, but for 12 years he was vice principal of the college. Um, and many of you probably know his works and books on the puzzle of ethics and various other publications, puzzle of God um, and the puzzle of gospels, the puzzle of Christianity and many other publications, including several co-authors with um, Charlotte Vardy, uh, mom of, of our girls here and wife of Peter. So it is really a great pleasure to now hand over to Peter and Petra and, and Tora and uh, give us uh, some, some thoughts, some reflections uh, about the book, about yourselves, and then we will have an opportunity for questions and answers both here on site and also with people who are joining us online. Thank you, Anna, and thank you so much for agreeing to host us here today. It's very special. I'm also very grateful to Natalie for all her hard work. Uh, and I know she's put a lot of effort into this, thank you. I also want to pay tribute to Dan cohn the, um who's done the illustrations on the book. He's been a friend of mine for 40 years, and he's done an outstanding job. It all really started when the girls were quite young. I think the first question was probably by Tora when she was five years old, who said, the Bible can't possibly be true because the dinosaurs existed long before Adam and Eve, so how can the Bible possibly be true? Perfectly sensible question. At about the, time, the same time, Petra, then eight, said, well, Jesus on the cross is meant to have asked God to forgive the people who are crucifying him because they didn't know what they were doing. But most people who do wrong don't know what they're doing either. So how can God send anybody to hell? Perfectly reasonable question again. And the questions went on from there. And I started keeping a record of them all. And all the questions are by the girls. None, none of them came from me. Uh, by no means are they only religious. They deal with all sorts of areas, including artificial intelligence, attempt by Neuralink to try and integrate artificial intelligence with human beings and where that's going to go in terms of the Oxford Institute for the Future of Humanity, things like DNA and genetics and to what extent we should be manipulating the genes of future embryos to try and improve intelligence or to get rid of diseases, um, things like the basics of DNA and how that works, things like discussions about war, things like about how much money is being spent on space exploration and whether we should be investing quite that much money in space when we could spend the money on fixing things here. 
And some people might think, well, they're slightly surprising things for young people to come up with. And I think, to be honest, the COVID epidemic had a big impact because, to be honest, I didn't take any notice of what the primary schools were recommending we did. And we tended to do whatever was interesting at the time. So we watched films like Flatland. Uh, we explored something of DNA. We watched Gattaca together. And all these prom prompted many, many more questions. So the questions continued. Um, so the questions are really fairly wide ranging. They include issues about death and issues about how we should deal with old people and many other related issues as well. And this idea of questioning is, of course, not new. Socrates, 2,300 years ago, was condemned to death for two charges. First of all, he didn't believe in the state gods. And secondly, he wanted to corrupt the young. And I think corrupting the young is what teachers should be about. And by that, he didn't mean corrupting sexually. He meant getting them to think for themselves. But the middle class citizens of Athens didn't like that. They wanted people to think they, the children to think like they did. So they would grow up emulating the parents. And uh, Socrates effectively was condemned to death for getting young people to think for themselves. So I think Petra and Tora are very much in that tradition. But I don't think these issues are new. I think they're very relevant today. And I think we don't educate people into asking questions. We educate them out of asking questions. And I think there are a whole reason, set of reasons for this. I think the questions asked by young people are by far the best questions. And I think in preparing this book and corresponding with some very leading figures, because we've been very lucky in the people who contributed, I mean, three cardinals, um, Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York, other Anglican bishops, um, the head, the moderator of the Church of Scotland, academics from Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, uh, Trinity, Dublin, New York, Melbourne, Rome, all sorts of other. We were very, very lucky with the level of contributing. And some of those were married and had children and said, these are exactly the sort of questions that my children are asking as well. Children want to ask questions, but often they don't get replies from their parents, either because the parents find the questions uncomfortable, or to be honest, because the pa parents haven't thought about the questions themselves. Now, you would have thought the questions could be answered by schools, but I'm afraid that doesn't happen. Teachers are under enormous pressure. They have to do more and more work. There's more and more administration. And the amount they have to cover is absolutely enormous. And there is far too little time for them to take time to reflect, to respond to questions. There's so much that needs to be covered. I think there are also issues in primary schools. And primary teachers are brilliantly trained across a wide range of subjects. But the number of people who are trained in philosophy and theology in primary schools is tiny, if almost non-existent. And therefore, they may do a very good job at five and six years old in telling Bible stories. But to be honest, unless you go beyond that fairly rapidly, people grow out of it. So by the time they get to 10, they've given up belief in the Tooth Fairy, uh, Father Christmas, uh, the Easter Bunny, and God. And I don't blame them, because they all seem very similar. There's no evidence for them, and nobody's responding to any of the questions. So by the time they're 11, I think they've moved beyond the primitive stage of Father Christmas, God, etc. There's a wonderful cartoon by the Australian cartoonist Lunig, a man with a bunch of wilted flowers in a graveyard. Behind him are gravestones with R.I.P. family, R.I.P. friends, R.I.P. God, R.I.P. Father Christmas. In a sense, that's where we are. Now, this was recognized by an extraordinary encyclical. That's a letter to the Catholic faithful by Pope John Paul II in 1998. It was called Fides et Ratio. I have a feeling that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict, may have been behind it, but it was under John Paul's name. But it, it's an extraordinary encyclical, because it's a history of philosophy. And it's quite brilliant, and it, as a philosopher, it was really accurate in summarizing where philosophy has come from, starting from the Greeks, going all the way through from Aquinas, up to Nietzsche, Hegel, up to the present day. And the encyclical says, we live in a world now dominated by relativism, by postmodernism, by materialism, and nihilism. Those are his words, not mine. Relativism, postmodernism, nihilism, and effectively, we have a world where nobody believes in anything. We're in a post-truth world. Now, it's extraordinary. That was written in 1998. But if you think of Trump, Oxford University Dictionary said post-truth was the word of the year in 2016. When he was inaugurated, he said, Trump said that the crowds at his inauguration were greater than the crowds at Obama's inauguration. The next day, the New York Times published a photograph taken at the same moment of time in both inaugurations. And it was quite clear the numbers attending Trump's inauguration was about half that of Obama's. And his spokesman said he was presenting alternative facts. And of course, the alternative facts then presented by Fox News are very influential. And if you're a Republican, you get almost all your news from Fox News. And effectively, the idea of truth has been so eroded that people no longer seek truth. And that's what the encyclical is on about. 
It said, we've got to get back to a search for truth. It said, there is no Catholic philosophy. That's extraordinary. There's no Catholic philosophy. Catholic tradition is dedicated to a search for truth. And faith means accepting there is a truth to be found. And we've got to get back to the questions that really preoccupy the Greeks. Why am I here? Is there any point in human life? What is it to be human? Is there a life after death? How do you account for evil? Those are the most important questions. In a way, those are the sort of questions that Petra and Tora were asking. So I think that what Fidesz at Rashi was saying was something profound. And he called for a new evangelization. Marvelous. Effectively picking up philosophy. But what sadly an awful lot of Catholic and Anglican bishops did was to say, ah, well, that means more catechesis. Now, catechesis is all very well, but effectively, unless people are given the opportunity to think deeply for themselves, to challenge and to question, they're just not going to take it seriously. And the result was the GCSEs were altered about six years ago. And due to the pressure from the bishops, the amount of Christian doctrine got increased massively at GCSE. So at 14, you're doing a redemption, atonement, salvation. And to be honest, people are just switching off because previously it was largely philosophy of religion and ethics, which is still there, but the content has been decreased. But that gave them the opportunity to think for themselves, to question. And that was removed. And the result is A-level, which isn't the same as GCSE, has declined in numbers. And I think that's a tragedy. And I think what Fidesz at Rashi was doing is we need to get back to taking the important questions seriously. And in a way, that's what this book is about. So if I had to say what the aim of this book would be, uh, for my point, it's to get adults to try and take children's questions more seriously than they have them past, not to dismiss them. But of course, many adults find that uncomfortable. And I, I think that's a weakness. I think it's a failure of parenting. And I think unless you take the question seriously, not only do the children miss out, but I think the adults do as well. So enough from me, Tora. Okay. Hello. While I get the chance to speak in front of you today, I just want to say the only reason I'm standing here is because of confidence. You see, this book is all about embracing the why in modern humanity. And the human race avoids answering that life-changing question. Adults don't want to be wrong which is why they mould children into a shape that resembles them, meaning the next generation of Earth's inhabitants is a repeat of the previous era, dodging anything unanswered. This universe and the wider universes is ridden with questions and mysteries, but none of them are answered. Take the Big Bang, a scientific phenomenon which most experts believe is the only reason for creation. They say the singularity caused this, but where did the singularity come from? If we join these dots, we find ourselves with something being created out of nothing. This is only one of the gaps in modern day life. The making of this book has quite possibly changed my life. As a child, I have been able to psychoanalyse these questions with my family and been able to talk about them and being treated as an adult. This is why The Philosopher's Daughters is on the shelves today, to give children the privilege of asking questions that most of them are deprived of and to shine a spotlight on the gaps in the modern day life that we live in. Thank you. Right. Okay. Hello, many of you are parents and many of you will one day become parents. And what I hope this book teaches you to understand is that those questions that children all over the world ask are important. But then they are told by churches, teachers, sports clubs, etc. that they are irrelevant childish queries. When no other adult figure steps in to contradict these false statements, children are steered away from asking questions. Eventually to the point where we have not a child but an adult who will never again ask questions such as these for fear of embarrassment and shame. So these questions are pushed into a quiet forgotten corner and silenced. I have two dreams for this book. One is not for it to become the world's bestseller, for it to make tons of money, but for it to become the new and improved Forgotten Corner, for it to grasp those questions, run away with them and spread them to the world. But why do children ask the best questions? Well, there's only one answer for this, and that's they haven't been programmed yet. Each time a child sees an adult, a bit of that adult rubs off on them, maybe an idea, opinion, a view, a way of thinking. The more you, a child sees a particular adult, the more of them rubs off on them. Imagine a toddler. The toddler sees its parents. Each parent sticks a little adhesive spot to the child, the kind you get at any good craft store. 
Then the child goes to the park, plus eight spots. Then to the nursery, plus 20 spots. Then to walks down the road, plus 14 spots. Soon the child is covered from head to toe in spots. Each one of those spots represent a person. That person had ideas, views, ways of thinking, and they have rubbed off on the child. Well, you may say, Petra, why do the parents only have added two spots? You said that they have more influence than, let's say, a primary school teacher. Well, when the child then looks at the parents again, plus another two spots, goes down to dinner, another two spots, passes the gravy, another two spots. Uh, you can see how that added, adds up. Uh, this is how most children are formed. They start to decide subconsciously that they will just ignore questions they asked when they were younger, except that the sky is blue, that some people think God exists, that the universe was creative. This book came along when me and my sister tried to ignore the spots, be creative and come up with our own ideas, opinions and views. With the help of others, we have kind of succeeded. I said I had two dreams for this book. One is for it to become the new and improved Forgotten Corner. The second is for, whilst it's spreading through the world, it to touch just one child, just one, and make them do the same as we did. Make them be creative, come up with their own ideas, ignore the spots. Um, this is why the Philosopher's Daughters exist today. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening and thank you. I should say, I had no input into either of those. I just told them, you've got to talk for four or five minutes. It's entirely up to you. And the spots and everything else, that's Petra and Tora. So anything anybody wants to raise to any of us, welcome. They're all fast asleep. <laughs> given us so much to think about. It's, it's, it's a tremendous and courageous project, but also the way you've engaged and the way you started, and it's just amazing. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Petra and Paul, Paul, thanks very much. That's amazing. I just wish the book had been out when I had my son who I was bringing up at home, and he used to ask them loads of questions. And it was just the two of us, so we all, I always had to try and think of things to say and at the dinner table I always wanted to have, you know, both of us sitting there and just the two of us having dinner and I bought a little box of cards that was, were kind of philosophical questions to discuss over dinner and that was really helpful but I wish I'd had your book. Thank you so much. And what do your friends at school say to you? Because I remember I had these sorts of questions when I was your age and some of my friends thought I was quite strange. <laughs> it was quite difficult to exist as a child with these questions. Well, I have to say, I mean, I'm in a primary school and I told my friends about the book and they were like, oh my gosh, is it like a fantasy novel? I know you're good at English. I never thought you were that good. I'm like, no, it's not a fantasy novel. It's a book about questions. And they were completely confused. They had no, because of course they're, I'm in year six and they're like 10, some of them are 11. I mean, my best friend just had her 11th birthday. And of course they, just like Petra's analogy, they have been programmed now. So they don't ask these questions anymore. And I gave some of my friends a copy and they were like, they, I have to say, they didn't say much because I think they were just a bit confused. <laughs> so when I, when you ask, what do my friends say? Not much. <laughs> so they're just a bit confused. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. They were, yeah, they seemed very excited to start with, but then, oh, you only asked the questions. Well, that's boring. Let's go on to something new. Uh, so yeah, they were very, mm, yeah, they weren't that, that interested to be honest. I should say they didn't only answer questions so as soon as we got replies, and as I say, we got some incredible replies. We used to sit over Costa, and it was a, a, a weekly ritual to go over all the replies that come in and discuss the replies, what we, uh, what we thought of them. And um, it's interesting, I was uh, asking which were the best replies, and I was briefing them in case anybody asked which were the worst replies. But two of the best ones, came, one came from Anna, who's got a rabbit called Bo, and was a beautiful illustration of that. And the other was from Sue, who, who, was, who was Tora, it just it happens to be here today. Um, most of the answers, I have to say, were very good. One or two were less good. <laughs> but I must say, when you approached us, Peter, with uh, 
possibility of engaging and answer some of these questions. We're re really excited. That's why several of us from the Institute uh, re uh, replied positively, because this was from the beginning, we felt it was such a unique project. Nobody has done anything like that. No, I, I think that's true. One of my sadnesses is we wanted to get more atheists and humanists contributing, and we wrote to all the atheist and humanist organizations in Australia, in New Zealand, in America, in this country, several times, not a single reply. And we tried very hard, and I don't know why we didn't get any reply, because I thought it was a wonderful opportunity for them to answer some of the questions. Um, but no reply, and we did try quite hard. We also sort of wrote to some leading atheist figures without success, and, and that was a pity. There are some atheists there, but they were approached because they were top scientists, for instance, rather than actually coming from a philosophical atheist position. Mm -hmm. Here? Yes, go. Uh, please wait to, to help me. <laughs> really. Okay, so this is a question from a former RE teacher um, and now granddad of six children. First question How can I buy the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other question uh, Resonances from a dad of my time. As a teacher and inspector of RE in both Roman Catholic and local education authority secondary schools, it's so sad to see an overload. Oh, uh, not really sure. Um, what they're saying. Oh, so it's kind of sad to see you overloaded and kind of being dropped be indoctrinated for the children um, when there's so little time for questioning. Can it change for the better in a synodal church? I think it's going to be very difficult. And to be honest, Michael Gove, when he was Secretary of State for Education, switched the British education system to be concentrating more on STEM. Now, STEM is very important, science, technology, etc. But there is no way that we can outcompete Singapore and China in STEM. They are pushing their children so hard, we can't do it. What we can do is to develop creativity. And that comes from the sort of questions that RE and philosophy asks. And my, my, uh, uh, I've got somebody who I know fairly well who's a top scientist in Singapore and she says she finds it very difficult to create to recruit postdoctoral students from uh, places like China or Singapore because they're very bright but they don't have creativity and I think what RS and philosophy does was to develop creativity and that is being squeezed out of the curriculum teachers have so little time and so much work to do and so much marking to do that they simply don't have time to sit and reflect and it means young people don't have the chance to sit and reflect and instead we're back to rs or something as a, a subject you're piled up knowledge and yes there's a degree of evaluation but they want time to be able to reflect and to think about things and that is no longer there and i think the chances of reversing it are very slim while the priority is given to STEM. And I can understand why. That's where the efficiency lies. That's where economics lies. So let's do maths at A-level, uh, uh, Richard Sunak wants. But not everybody can do maths at A-level. And to be honest, an awful lot of the wealth of Britain is not based on STEM. It is based on creativity. And I think that is not being developed and not taken seriously. So am I pessimistic? Yes, I am. But one of the things you know, I believe passionately in that it's better to light a candle and curse the darkness. And I think one has to retain hope and keep trying, even though sometimes the times are quite dark. Uh, thank you both. Was there a question for each of you that you were both really excited by that you were waiting for the answer for? I'm going to put in on yeah. that one. Okay. Um, Daddy has mentioned it already. Um, but it was my question about whilst Jesus was being hung on the cross, um, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Most people don't know what they're doing when they're doing bad. How can anyone be sent to hell? That was one of my favourite questions we asked, as well as the one that I was most excited to get answers back from. And I think we did get satisfactory answers from that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, oh, this is hard. Now, there is one of them, which when I think of the questions I asked, it just springs to mind. My dad's already mentioned it. It was the first one that um, I was obsessed with dinosaurs at the time. I had dinosaurs all over my wall. You still are. 
Well, yeah, but <laughs> very, very much in, into it. And I said, well, dinosaurs existed long before humans, so surely the Bible can't be true because then Adam and Eve couldn't have be the first person there. And I was very confused by this, and I was very put off Christianity by this. <laughs> um, and basically, I don't know why it's my favourite question and the one I was most excited for an answer to, because I have to say, I think I can come up with an answer myself. Adam and Eve is a parable to show meaning. So I don't know why it's my, the one I was most excited for answers for, but I think generally the novelty of it never wears off. So. But Tora, one of the, when we were going through the sort of questions some of these people might be asking, one of the questions we came up with was, if you had to answer another question, ask another question now, what might that be? And you came up with, or was it Petra who came up with the, the, oh, the question? Oh yeah, uh, it was an extension to the question, what is love? Because perhaps Dylan is always sing about it, and it like it's always not really there. Divorces happen all the time, and like weddings happen all the time. So what is love? Uh, my extension to that question, what was, what do we love? Do we love looks? Because when they're old, um, frankly, they don't look the same and not very nice sometimes. Um, um, is it personality? Because that changes if you get dementia. What do we love? I think it's a very interesting one. <laughs> so will there be a volume two? Not planned at the present time. <laughs> <laughs> Although my dad has had speculations about teen questions. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> Anna? Oh, Joseph, and, and then Sue. So. Sorry. Um, you were so kind to, uh, to sign uh, your book to the Young Journalists of Orion, Orion Primary School. And my question would be just, uh, just imagine um, uh, your six students, or those who are interested in uh, philosophy, uh, bearing in mind, I'm coming from a very poor part of London, okay. when children in their families uh, don't have that support, which, uh, yeah. which, for example, you have. So my question is that, what advice could you give them where to start if they are interested in philosophy in general and uh, my question would be that uh, could you compile a reading list of your favorite book which uh, books which really helped you uh, to engage with these topics not now uh, compiling the list but uh, uh, if there was a reading list that's a, very, that's a very good idea, and we have got a website to the Philosopher's Daughters, and what we will do is to try and put on that a suggested reading list. I think it's a very good idea. Year 6 is, is quite young, to be honest. Um, one of the first books, when they got to 12 or 13, I would go for with The Last Days of Socrates, when he's put on trial for his life, and that's a very good book, but Year 6 is a bit... Give me time and we'll have a look at that. I good would, idea. I would say, just because I am a Year 6, um, starting off with philosophy, I'm just going to say, it's not one of those things, philosophy, I find it's one of those things which is independent. If you want to ask these questions, I would say you have to start off by being confident and having that self-esteem, because if you simply rely on, if you ask your parents or teachers, should I be interested in philosophy, and they say no, if they do say no, then, and you just go off it, and you don't do it anymore, there's no chance. You have to be independent, you have to come up with your own views, as we said. And eventually, once you've been doing it, and once you've made your point, I would find that when I've started making my points, other people, like my teachers, have actually started coming round, and started actually saying, well, not like saying it, but like, I can tell they're feeling it, like, this isn't actually such a bad thing, this isn't a childish thing. So I think you have to just be really independent at such a young age, and just think for yourself and have self-esteem. So yeah, it's my well, That's not easy to develop, because you see in the past there was, a tri there was a triangle. You had church, you had family, you had school reinforcing each other, that's all gone. Mm -hmm. Most people don't go to church except in order to get into secondary schools. Um, the, the family has got almost nothing and therefore 
the school can't do it by themselves. They've got so much on. So that old reinforcing triangle, which existed 100 years ago, maybe even 50 or 60 years ago, has gone. So I, I, it's very perceptive at all. I think that's right. But very difficult for a teacher in a deprived area to develop that confidence. Not easy to do. Sorry, Sue. Sue. Mm -hmm. Petra, I really like your image of the spots and how they stick on you. And I was just wondering if some of the answers were more spotty than others and actually affected your thinking or whether the answers that were given helped to expand that independence you're talking about Torah so it was your own thinking developed from the answers um I think that most of the answers because we've been doing it for so long this is where the book came around we we weren't adding spots to ourselves I think we were because there were multiple answers in most questions, we were able to mix them. Yes, steal some ideas, but consciously be able to do it in so subconsciously. And we don't, we still don't ignore these questions. We will continue to ask the same questions again and again. I normally come home from school having asked a question, ask it to my parents as well to get different ideas and different views. I just think it's good to mix them up and come up with your own definition, come up with your own answer. Okay, so I would definitely say that I am agnostic as it and I have to say I am an agnostic just because I find it hard to believe the miracles and simply because there is no evidence that God does not exist, but there is also no evidence that it does exist. So I find my just position to be in is agnostic. I have to say the answers that we gave, there are certainly things that I haven't thought about before. And I'm not going to say I'm not agnostic anymore. But before the book came around, I was agnostic leaning towards atheist. But I think having the views of some other actual people who are really strong Christians, it's helped me a bit to actually get some different points of view than just ones from agnostics or not or theists so yeah we have a question here um, to Beth and Dora what is your next step your next project do you see a path ahead when when places like Heathrow pass where can you find a community with whom to investigate Okay, I'm gonna go there. Okay, so we live in a very rural area where everyone's very tightly knit, everyone knows everyone. You fall out with someone, you're going to come across them. So I feel that whatever happens in life, we're always going to be cushioned. We have a place to go. And I know most people don't have that, but if we have a question, if we, uh, fail miserably in life we have somewhere to fall back on we have roots and i think i don't know what the next project is i don't know where we're going to go next I don't know where i'm going to be in the future but we do have somewhat people we have people around us to fall back on to ask and to rely on so i think that i'm extremely grateful for childhood i've had embracing those questions being able to my parents have pushed me in the right directions but just given me views please it might be a good idea not to go into smoking but it's your own choice <laughs> <laughs> and if you do drugs then you'll have a quite high chance of death rate so I have I've had a really amazing childhood and when I grow up I don't know what I'm going to be I've always said to my dad and my family when they ask me what do you want to be when you grow up I mean it's all very well saying oh I want to be the next person who makes iPhones it's quite likely in the future that we'll have holograms instead of iPhones so no one knows what the future holds and I honestly don't know where my next project is but all I'm going to do is I'm going to not change because of others I'm going to keep asking these questions and I've always thought if you keep asking these questions you keep being your own person then there's nothing that can go wrong and you just have to work hard be your own person and make well-informed choices and then whatever the future holds will be good you could be the prime minister <laughs> 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 not 
小事儿，帮我妈上课。<笑> I think our time is probably up. Is it? It's, it's everything else on him because burning for no. Nope. Oh, we talk the questions that they give us. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Well, thank you again. Thank you again, Anna, and thank you, Margaret Beaufort, because without them, none of this would be possible. So, you know, thank can you, you join with me in saying thank you to them? Because of them. Thank you. thank you so much for coming from Yorkshire and being with us, and um, for you who are here, and we can continue our conversation over a glass of wine. That sounds wonderful. Uh, or um, soft drinks. There are, there are some soft drinks. It's their choice. <laughs> it's their choice. <laughs> It's been really stimulating and very inspiring and I just I'm wondering how we can keep in touch and maybe revisit uh, some of the questions we pose here, like where you are in a couple of years time, uh, do you have totally different questions, have you got new answers, so if you agree we, we would love to keep in touch and see how... We're delighted, yes, yeah, amazing. good news. So congratulations again, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. There will be a few people who want to, including me, who would like a book to design by yourself. So thank you right. again. Thank you again. Thank you.